I want to ask uh, who does not know what this is, because maybe you weren't here, and who knows what it is and you forgot to bring yours from home. That's going to happen for a while. This is our new workbook that we use during the service. We have also ones for kids. They're, they're different colors, but they're the same. Um, if you need one, uh, don't worry, they're cheap. We want you to get used to using it. So if you raise your hand, we'll give you one. Um, please do that. Usher's coming down. Just keep your hands up and we'll get those distributed. I've been writing in mine this morning. Be sharing tonight with my action group. Okay. We uh, are going to be studying this Easter, going up to Easter, and just keep your hands up and we'll, we'll get to you as we go along. There's, uh, yeah, thank you for helping out. Um, we're we're going to be running up to Easter and then a little bit after that looking at highlights uh, from the last week of Christ's ministry. And this will conclude our study of the Gospel of Luke. Now, you may recall at the beginning of the Gospel, the way Luke opens it up, he said that he wrote this in order to help a churchgoer. He called him Theophilus. Could be a real name, could be a pseudonym. means lover of God. uh, To decide what he really believed. Because it's one thing to attend church and to confess doctrine, and it's another thing to actually embrace it truly. So through Easter, we'll ask ourselves, Uh, this question, what am I willing to believe? And today is our first opportunity to use the workbook too, and I hope it's helpful to you. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. Let me read it to you. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village in front of you. Where on entering, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it uh, just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And the answer, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The last week of Jesus' ministry began with a bang, what we call the triumphal entry. This was a time of the Passover when Jews from all nations returned for a festival. The total people in Jerusalem was probably in excess of a million. That's an awful lot for a city that size. Um, The largest, I think this was the largest semi-spontaneous flash mob in history, um, welcoming Jesus with cheers and palm branches, because it just grew and grew and grew, and more people got involved. This was uh, Sunday. The next Friday, Jesus would be confronted by Israel's leaders, condemned by a Roman governor. Jesus said he intentionally went to Jerusalem to provoke that confrontation. It's very clear he said that. It was an essential part of God's plan to save us. But Jesus had to juggle two objectives upon arriving at the city. One, he had to fulfill the prophecies of the arrival of the Messiah. Two, he needed to avoid being arrested by Rome because there were things he had to do that week. The time was not yet right. Passover was still to come. And if he, if he came in directly claiming to be king as a rival to Roman authority, they probably would have arrested him then and there. He needed a way to communicate that he is the son of David, the heir to David's throne, not by words, but by a sign, something Jews would immediately comprehend, but the Romans would not grasp. And he found an answer in how David identified his first son of David to inherit his throne. When David was old and he was dying, 
He has several sons who, would succeed, who could succeed him. I'm going to speak from 1 Kings chapter 1. You can look at it later. Among them was Adonijah. Adonijah was a, a strong, aggressive young man. He would be an obvious candidate, and he wanted the job. And then there was Solomon, still rather young for this role, uh, the surviving child of David uh, uh, and, uh, and his adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, after murdering her husband, David publicly confessed, repented of his wick uh, weak wickedness, and he married Bathsheba, and they had Solomon. Uh, and uh, by all accounts, Bathsheba remained his favorite. In fact, he privately promised Bathsheba that their son, Solomon, would one day rule after him. Adonijah decided he wasn't going to just wait around for his dad to die. He had already gathered support among some leaders, promising them a place in the new government, and he actually began to celebrate his own coronation with his friends. So Bathsheba gathered people still loyal to David and went to see him for three reasons. One, to tell David of Adonijah's presumptuous behavior. Number two, to plead for her life because Adonijah was the kind of man who would not leave any alternative claimants to the throne. He would remove Solomon and Bathsheba permanently. And number three, to remind David of his promise to her that their child, Solomon, would be the one David would choose to rule. David was weak. He couldn't get out of bed, but he had enough presence of mind to act quickly. He had to gain the support of the people for Solomon before Adonijah's power play had a chance to develop. So he said, put Solomon on my mule. Go down to the Kidron Valley, to the spring there, and anoint Solomon as king. A question used to come into my mind. Why a mule? Why a mule? And that actually is an important part of this, uh, this whole uh, event. Because in Israel, horses were used for battle and war. Donkeys and mules interchangeably were used for riding by the aristocracy and the royalty. They were very sure-footed and difficult terrain. Uh, wild donkeys were domesticated and mules were imported. Uh, David, of course, had his own livery or his tack that his personal mule would wear. Symbols of kingship that marked his own personal animal. Putting Solomon on what was seen as the royal mule authenticated the boy as his choice, kind of like flying him in on Air Force One or something. It was just kind of obvious. Then he said, now, then bring him, bring Solomon up the, from the Kidron Valley uphill, bring him to, up to the city with great procession, blow trumpets, declare him to be the new king, declare him to be the son of David that is chosen to rule. So Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. And then they blew the trumpet. And all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. People spontaneously joined in with great joy. They received Solomon as the son of David who was chosen to rule. Adonijah's coup never got off the ground. So later on, it was so memorable an event that it became a model for the prophet Zechariah who talked about uh, a coming king, the one who would bring salvation, would come to Jerusalem mounted on a donkey. Colt, just like Solomon. The important part of the triumphal entry was not really the, the palm branches. People had palm branches because that's what they used for the festival, and so they were a perfect garnish to use uh, as, it, as this happened, but the important part of Christ's plan was to enter the city on a donkey or a mule. In fact, when you look at the way it's set up, I'm pretty certain Jesus had it arranged and it was a call sign. You know, somebody asked, why are you untying it? Just say, Lord has need of it. You know, and just say those words and just, okay, go ahead and take it. Because he was looking for a, a, a donkey that had not been ridden, which means it had been bred for the aristocracy. You know, nobody else rides this but you. Uh, and so it probably had a, some kind of a livery or attack of that nature also. And that was it. That was Jesus' plan. Didn't have to say a word. Just ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, one that was bred for royalty. From the Mount of Olives, he went down the, to the Kidron Valley, and then he went up essentially along the same path that Solomon took. Totally understated. Didn't have to say a word. No claim of kingship from his lips. 
for the Romans to react to. In fact, the Romans had no idea why everybody was going crazy. This is just some guy riding it on a donkey. What are we missing here, you know? But every Jew who was taught, they didn't have Sunday school, of course, but they were taught as they were growing up the stories of the Old Testament. They knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. He was the son of David who was chosen to rule. And so they shouted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And of course, every Old Testament theme, every Old Testament theme branched out at the Messiah's appearance to include all nations. And so God exalted Jesus as the divine king over all the earth. And since the title king suggests a single political nation, Christians very soon exchanged that title for a bigger one, one more generic and one larger, and that is Lord. Every time you speak of and you pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, you are referring to King Jesus. The first essential gospel question that Luke poses to Theophilus from Christ's final week, am I willing to believe that Jesus is King or Lord? Around 1970, I was a brand new Christian. I spent two weeks Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and we were studying in inner varsity camp. We were studying the Lordship of Christ. What a thing for a young Christian to study. It, it shaped my life. One of the speakers was Gwyn Walters, a Welshman. I followed him to Gordon Conwell, tried to preach like him, never did. Um, he's the first preacher that really touched my heart. Uh, and I remember him uh, pitying Americans because we had no concept of royalty. Uh, he said, it must be difficult to have allegiance to a king when you don't have any experience with a king. In fact, you rejected a king. Because a king is a focal point for a people's identity. I remember encountering the, the notion uh, later on, in a, uh, looking at a James Bond film. Bond said he served queen and country. And I, was in, I was familiar with the idea of serving your country, but serving the queen. Yeah, because a nation is distilled in its monarch. And that's true even when contemporary monarchs are mostly figureheads. In the ancient world, it certainly was true because they were not figureheads. They, they did represent the nation and the empire, a king or an emperor or a pharaoh or a Caesar or whatever. Their opinions became law. Their character defined the nation's values. If their nation won a battle, the king won the battle. If a nation built a wonder, the king built, built the wonder. A kingdom took on the character and the glory of its king. And people found their deepest identity in their king. And it could transcend race or status or any other kind of prejudice that people had. You know, as a Jew in the Roman Empire, the Apostle Paul could be imprisoned without much process because they didn't think very highly of Jews. But when the officials discovered he was a Roman citizen, they afforded him the honor of somebody in Caesar's kingdom. As a citizen, Paul could appeal to Caesar himself, and he did. And every other consideration, even though he was a Jew, all that was secondary. To believe Jesus is your king means that you find your identity in him. I belong to Christ's kingdom. The kingdom of God is distilled in King Jesus, and it makes every other consideration secondary. The Apostle Peter thought that way. He said, we're all citizens of one nation or another, and most people are very proud of the nation of their citizenship, but Peter said, we ought to think of our, think of our earthly citizenship kind of loosely as a secondary part of our identity that's only temporary. First, Christians are citizens of God's kingdom, and therefore we are like strangers or exiles or refugees in the contemporary nation in which we live, like the United States. And it's not to downplay our American citizenship, it's to exalt the citizenship in God's kingdom. Christ is our king. We are truly and we are proudly Americans, but Christ is our king, not metaphorically, but actually. It would be a metaphor if Jesus were dead. It would be a metaphor if he had not yet been given power and authority, but he has been. And he is alive. This got me thinking this week. Silly thought, I suppose, about dual citizenship. You know, in America, you can only have dual citizenship if, if your citizenship in another country came automatically, 
like you have American parents have a child that's born in some other country, they're automatically a citizen, that's okay. Or if you marry somebody and you become a citizen, that's okay. But an American is not allowed to voluntarily apply for dual citizenship to a foreign power. And that got me a little worried. I, I voluntarily sought admission to God's kingdom. Does that mean that my dual status is illegal? Do I have to give up one of my citizenships? Well, no, because I could also argue that I was born into the kingdom of God or reborn, and so I could get by on that technicality. But the point is, it's not really a problem, is it? Because the American government does not recognize the kingdom of God as real, literally real, or recognize Jesus as a living king. They would see my citizenship in God's kingdom as a religious metaphor, no big deal. I wonder if Luke's friend Theophilus thought that. Yet the gospel calls us to believe in the kingship of Jesus quite literally because he's alive. He rose from the dead. He is alive. He is a living and reigning monarch, ours. Not only that, the gospel requires us to recognize Jesus above every other authority. Peter insists that Christians see themselves as foreign nationals when it comes to political citizenship. A friendly visiting stranger, even a refugee who has found a temporary home here in America, and we love it, but who is principally and permanently a citizen of God's kingdom that will exist long after every nation is a memory and dust. Now, fortunately, obeying my King Jesus does not generally put me at odds with my duties as an American. In fact, God's word commands me to be an exemplary citizen. Respect whoever is in charge. Lead a quiet, godly, and dignified life. That is a quote. A quiet, godly, and dignified life. Get along with the government because our, our business, we have a great commission. We're, we, we're, we're doing all the things that we do so that we can work on the kingdom and expand the kingdom of God. Jesus commands me to give my employer the same energy and focus that I would give him if Jesus were my boss. Jesus commands me to be a great husband, a great wife, committed to loving and respecting my spouse. It's only when Jesus' declared will diverges from society's will that there is a potential conflict. My government, my employer, my teacher, my spouse bids me to do something God forbids or forbid something God commands. Could be big, could be small. People who believe the gospel treat Jesus as king, even when it means going against a valid human institution. Now, in practice, such conflicts usually work out rather well in America because we are blessed to live in a nation that highly values individual freedom, as good as the Constitution was when it was written, we got a magnificent Bill of Rights. And in America, when Christians are in conflict with the social demands of, of institutions, society is going to view it as a conflict with our religion, our faith, our conscience, and is going to give us as much room as possible to accommodate us, not out of love for Jesus, but out of love for personal freedom. Well, it's a different thing in totalitarian regimes. There, the implications of Jesus' lordship are much more threatening. See, the gospel proclaims Jesus Christ as Lord. They take that seriously. That means supreme. And in a totalitarian regime, only those in power are supreme. And there is no room for any other loyalty above that. None. And there, Christianity is seen as a threat. Again, not out of hatred for Jesus. And usually not out of any particular reason. It's just out of fear that the allegiance higher than, a, than to the state or the party or whatever, that's a threat. Christians under such regimes do well to, do, to bear no ill will toward those in power and stay under the radar as much as possible. You see that tension right off the bat in the early church in the Roman Empire, which after Caesar became increasingly totalitarian. You know, I've read some of that time. You probably have too. I'm not aware of anything that Christians believed or did that threatened the Roman Empire. But Christians were feared because they treated Jesus as alive. 
as a living king, not a metaphor, but really alive. The Romans thought he was dead. They killed him. But these Christians insisted he's resurrected. Now, this Jesus that they believe is alive, he seems to be a nice enough guy. Pilate didn't really want to execute him. But there was always that chance that something would come up. And these Christians would obey their Jesus and disobey Caesar. And that's just unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Well, since there were no real conflicts, the Romans approached it kind of theoretically. And they just asked Christians, would you simply, would you simply make a token offering to Caesar as supreme? Okay? Essentially a toast in his name to the emperor. And you can do this alongside your own preferred religion. Believe anything you want about what goes on in heaven. Believe anything you want about what happens in the afterlife. Just say, Caesar is Lord. Just say that. That, that here and now, in the real world, Caesar has ultimate authority, right? And then your property, your good name, your freedom, your opportunities, your life, will remain yours. Christians wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do that simple thing. Because Jesus is not just about what goes on in heaven. And he's not just about what goes on in the afterlife. He is our living king. Jesus is my Lord. You see that reflected, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 12. It's by the Holy Spirit that we're able to say Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. He has... Jesus has commanded us to be the best Roman citizens you've got. But theoretically, if Caesar and Jesus demand different things, we're going to obey Jesus every time. And Christians lost property. And Christians lost their good name. And Christians lost their freedoms and opportunities. And some lost their lives. And that drove them into hiding, into the catacombs. And never did they respond by working to do evil to Rome. All they wanted to do was treat Jesus as king. That was it. So, what do you believe, Theophilus? You know, many in the church imagine Christianity as a philosophy, something involving heaven and the future and stuff. Not so much here and now. Certainly nothing to rival the authority of my employer or my spouse or my school or my government. But the fact is that Christianity is centered around a real and living person. A person who is God's chosen king of all the world. Only Christians treat him that way right now because he's busy saving people. But that's the point. That's how you know a Christian. As it says in the scriptures, it's by the Holy Spirit they say Jesus is Lord. So Theophilus or any churchgoer, ask yourself, ask yourself, Am I willing to believe Jesus is king? Or as we would say it today, that Jesus is Lord. That, that means that most of the time, I'm going to treat others, including my superiors, better than I would otherwise. Because he tells me to. But it also means that if and when there is an unavoidable conflict, there's not going to be any question about my allegiance. Remember Peter, early in Acts when he's facing the Jewish authorities, he says, look, if you're asking us to choose between obeying God and obeying you, I mean, that's not a hard choice. Because to us, it isn't just about our faith or our religion. It's about our king. Jesus is Lord. And you know, I, I realize you don't believe that. That's your business. I mean you no offense. You can take that up with him when he comes back. But I believe it. Jesus is my living and my reigning king. I must obey him, and I will. Now, as I read the triumphal entry, that's what I hear Luke asking Theophilus. Therefore, that's what I hear God asking me. Am I willing to believe that Jesus is Lord? What do you hear in the text? That's what you have that workbook for. What did you hear? Did you hear that? Did you hear something else like that? I encourage you to write down. In other words, take responsibility for what you heard in the scriptures. What did you get there? Write it down. We're going to see other very important things that the gospel means as we continue through Christ's final week. But it all begins here. Jesus is Lord because if he isn't, nothing else in the gospel makes sense or carries any weight. But if he is, the whole gospel flows out of it. 
The workbook you have gives you a place to respond to what you have heard from God's word. Discipleship gets hung up when we get knowledge and we don't move to obedience. So I encourage everyone just to do something when we hear God say something. Uh, if it was about Jesus being Lord, what could I do? All kinds of stuff. Maybe I'll celebrate this week. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. I'll sing that with the family perhaps. Or maybe uh, one of the things I do uh, this afternoon, I'm going to revel in Jesus' kingship, and in my prayer, I'm going to end it like I do sometimes. Maybe you never have. Just end your prayer with one word. Sir. Changes everything. <laughs> You're talking to a king. Try it. Uh, maybe I need to treat somebody with greater respect because Jesus, my Lord, tells me to. Maybe I need to disobey a demand from my society because Jesus' authority is higher. Maybe I need to reevaluate my faith. Maybe there's more to Jesus than I gave him credit for. I encourage you to write down what you heard and how you intend to respond. It doesn't have to be a big deal, although it may be. <laughs> And share this with one or two friends. I got a couple of guys I'll share with tonight. Uh, what did they hear? What are they doing? And then we pray for each other. And you'll see what a powerful tool this workbook can be. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we look at the leaders of this world and at all their many faults, they have as many faults as we would have in their place. And we wonder how it is it that you have favored us so to exalt Jesus as our king and to make us citizens of his kingdom. He's faithful, he's just, he's wise, he's fair, he's merciful, he's sympathetic. His, his power never goes to his head. His power never gets out of control. He never forgets his love and utter commitment to you, Father. We fear authority wielded by anyone else, but him we trust. In every relationship and every responsibility, he makes us better people. And when we do need to disobey, when we do need to disappoint somebody who feels like they just have to control us, He's right there with us, never leaving us alone, but giving us the privilege of standing in the same faithfulness that marked him out as special. King Jesus, thank you, sir. Thank you for granting us citizenship in the only kingdom that will last, the only kingdom that will thrive to the glory of God throughout eternity. We are yours to command, and we will do our best to follow you, sir. Amen.